Hi folks, Triss here. Thanks for listening to Mode and Prometheus, and thanks especially to all of you who have joined our Patreon. We don't run ads, so the whole podcast is supported by you. If you'd like to help out, head over to patreon.com forward slash Prometheus. Members get behind-the-scenes notes, early access, bonus episodes, and a lot more exciting stuff. Today's story is called Drown, and is about normal people. If the bridge had not been out, Abigail Reacher would most likely not have ruined her life. Or if she had been a bit lazier, caught the second bus rather than deciding to walk home from the changeover stop, maybe this would just have all happened later. You cannot hide your true self forever. But she was not lazy, and the bridge was closed. So it happened today. And it happened like this. Abby's walk took her along the canal, a few hundred metres of shaded embankment before crossing the bridge, and then another couple of streets to home. But the bridge was closed. A sign giving no more information than for essential work. The next bridge is another few hundred metres further on, and then she'll need to walk the same back again on the other side. It's what she should do, she knows. It's the safe option. But... There's no one here. The embankments are both empty. There is no putt-putt-putt of an oncoming narrowboat. If she's quick... She steps out onto the canal. The surface tension is somewhere between a rubber sheet and a freshly mown lawn. The water laps gently at the white soles of her trainers. With another quick look up and down, she dashes across the water, leaving a trail of ripples behind her like a very localised hailstorm. She looks in alarm at the damp footprints as she steps onto the other bank. She didn't think of that. She looks more in alarm at the man she would swear hadn't been there just seconds before, but now stands on the bank she just came from, a look of disgust on his face, and a camera phone pointed straight at her. So Abby does the only thing she can think of. She runs. Mate, 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 mate. Tobin is on her practically before she's crossed the school gates, barreling past a pair of teaching assistants, scattering a group of first years like a wrecking ball through Skittles, and doing a respectful detour around One-Eyed Annie. She skids to a halt just in front of Abby, and breathlessly asks, You've seen it, right? Mate, I've got to know. Was it you? It? It! Come on, you must have seen it! Course she's seen it. Lipstick has appeared silently behind them. She moves in a way that makes the SAS seem like a marching band. Despite constant tailing, the SAS have yet to work out how she does it. What is it? Oh, mate! Tobin looks at her with something like horror. Have you really not seen it? She's totally seen it, Lipstick mutters. But Tobin is already loading the video and shoving it in front of Abby. Look! Abby has, indeed, already seen it. She's seen it 24 times. Once with an increasingly sick feeling in her stomach, and the other 23 through finger cracks or just hearing the splash of her trainers on water as she drove her face into her pillow, trying to find the tiniest sparkle, the smallest glimmer of hope, or even just a flicker of understanding as to why she did it, why she did it, did that, why she was ever stupid enough to show them what she was. It had racked up a million views by the end of yesterday evening. She's known Tobin and Lipstick since they were first years here. They've been inseparable since almost the first day. And now Tobin is looking at her... worried? Is she scared of her? And Lipstick. Lipstick is wearing a sneer, but Lipstick is always wearing a sneer, just how her face works. In her current state, Abby can't tell if it's meant to be a mocking sneer or a comforting one. Was it you? Tobin asks. Looks like you, says Lipstick. But it's not certain. The girl in the video definitely looks like Abby. Same height, 
same hair, same coat, but you can't see the face well. I'm not like that, Abby mutters and pushes past them. Got a coat like yours? Lipstick says, falling in behind her. Yeah, well, a lot of people got coats like that. Abby pulls up her hood and walks faster. Lipstick and Tobin look at each other. So it wasn't you? Tobin asks. No, Abby says shortly. I'm not weird. Lipstick looks at Tobin, mouths lying. Abs, she says. We're not idiots. What do you want me to say? Abby snaps, trying to keep her voice down to avoid making a scene. Tell us it was you. Abby looks at them. Tobin's wide eyes and Lipstick's drill sergeant stare. She shakes her head and mutters, I'm not like that. Fine, Lipstick stares and pushes past her. Tobin gives Abby an apologetic look and hurries after her. The first period is maths. The teacher, Andrew Graham, is writing a set of equations on the whiteboard. There is a double take as Abby comes in. You might miss it if you weren't specifically looking, but Abby is. One million views. Everyone has seen it. Abby can feel the eyes of her classmates, everyone like a nail being driven into her palm. Emma Southwell is glaring at her. Abby thinks she might be about to get up and march over, but Mr. Graham calls for silence and starts the lesson. Abby's never been a fan of maths, She usually ends up cribbing off of Tobin, who has such a natural affinity with the subject that it's widely believed her mother had an affair with a differential equation. But right now she's grateful to dive into a world so far removed from her own. She is snapped out of what little solace algebra can give when a voice comes over the tannoy system, announcing a special assembly in the afternoon. Have you ever been in the middle of a crowd of people who haven't yet worked out they hate you? Because this is an important point. You may think I'm using this as a way of describing the special assembly that Abby is currently attending, pressed into the sports hall along with the entire staff and student body, and yes, I am. But Abby doesn't feel this way because she is in the assembly. She feels this way all the time. People, as a rule, do not like profits. They remember what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah, and those places did not have the benefit of the city's 2,000 years of practice. It is, of course, a more tolerant society now. Prophets, everyone says, can live within the community as long as they keep the miracles to themselves. But everyone knows what it means when a red cross has been painted on a door. No one really trusts someone who cannot drown. Abby knows this kind of tolerance. It's the kind that only happens because people have hammers and nails, and they make quite clear, remember how to use them. The head teacher has stood on the stage. The senior staff are all arrayed behind him, all in their identical, featureless masks, all with their hands clasped behind their backs. He is saying how they may have seen a video of someone from this school engaging in deviant behaviour. He is reminding them of the school's strict policy against miracles and other witchcraft. The closest exit is a fire door. Jude Williams, her drama teacher, is standing next to it, eyes on the head. Abby wishes she knew what it was like to be in a crowd and not be aware of the fastest route out of it. Tobin and Lipstick are not with her. They made her feel safe, made her feel like she passed. Usually they'd all be stood together, but now they're a couple of rows ahead, not looking at her. She doesn't wait for them when the head is done and everyone begins to file out. She doesn't want to deal with the rejection. Hi, Abby. Jude Williams intercepts her. Can I have a word? Uh, I've got to get to class, Abby says. Abby likes Jude, even though she thinks she tries too hard. Some teachers wear suits, 
Some, the ones who tried to be approachable, wear jeans and button-downs. Jude has a click-a-clack collection of beads holding her braids in place, a tweed waistcoat, and sits in her class with a pipe clenched between her teeth, and the smell of weed lingering like drunks around a bus station. Still, going off alone with an authority figure doesn't end well. It'll just take a minute, Jude says, and motions her into an empty classroom. When they're inside, she bolts the door and leans her back against it, and is suddenly far more serious. Tell them it was a film assignment. What? Special effects. Tell them it was a special effects assignment, part of your coursework. You had to record a special effect. You put, I don't know, boxes in the water to stand on. I'll back you up if they ask. Abby dawdles on the way home, takes the long route, past the tree that caught fire when the asteroid flew over a month ago, past the little shrine with the teddy bear on Bow's Common, dedicated to someone dead she never met. For a while, she is tailed by one of the SAS men who follow Lipstick until eventually she says, She's not with me today. Oh, um, ma'am, the SAS man says. Where is she? I don't know. We've kind of had a falling out. Have they? She thinks they have. They must have done. Lipstick and Tobin obviously don't want to be around Abby now they know what Abby is. Oh, uh, I hope you work it out, the man says. He hurries off, and Abby can hear him say into his wrist, Code Red, this is Code Red, we have lost the target, repeat. She is taking the long route because she knows what is waiting for her. Abigail Reacher, her mother yells as soon as she opens the door. There it is. What is this? She's holding up a tablet, playing what is by now a very familiar video. She doesn't tell her mother it's a film class project. Instead she tries, it's not me, don't lie to me. Her mother has the stance of someone who wants to throw things, like she would have screwed the tablet into a ball if she was able. What have I told you about this... this stuff? You said you won't have me doing it under your roof, Abby says sullenly. But I wasn't under your roof. Her mother's lips draw to a line, thin as razor wire. Don't get smart with me. You know what I meant. When you have your own roof and your own bills, you can live your life in whatever strange, unnatural way you like. While it's my roof and my bills... You do what I tell you. I will not have you make people talk about us like this. What would your father say if he saw this? Nothing, Abby thinks. He's never said anything. Abby's parents first realised their child was different at the age of five, during an aborted swimming lesson. Her mother had been excited then. She'd bought Abby a little swimming costume with a picture of a dolphin on it, and Abby had flapped the armbands like they were wings. And then they climbed into the pool and encouraged Abby to climb in after them. Abby didn't quite get then what she'd done wrong. I can't believe it, her mother had said in the car home. I've never been so embarrassed. I think you're overreacting, her father had said. I just don't understand where she got it from. Was there any of this on your side? I don't think that's how it works. At that point, Abby didn't understand the conversation, but she still remembers it, and she does now. Her father comes into her room later, sits on her bed, waits patiently for her to take off her headphones. So, he says, clearly embarrassed at the situation. So, your mother asked me to talk to you. Did she want you to tell me I'm an abomination as well? Her father sighs. Look, Abby, we're your parents. We'll always love you, no matter what. Your mum will always love you, no matter what. She's just scared for you. When you're a bit different, the world isn't always kind. Yeah, I'd noticed. Look, 
I don't want to tell you not to be who you are, but just be careful, okay? It's easier for everyone if you blend in. And I know it's not fair. It's not. But that's just how it is right now. I know your mum gets carried away with this stuff, but that's all she really wants. She just wants you to be safe. She's got a funny way of showing it. Yeah, he sighed. Yes, she does. When he leaves, Abby goes to run a bath. She leaves the windows shut and lets the room steam to a foggy shroud. She steps in. The water is warm, comforting, and Abby lays on it like she's resting on a cloud, staring at the ceiling, wishing that just like a normal person, she could drown. The rumours are breeding, in the corridors, in the classrooms, in the teacher's lounge. It's Photoshop, says Tracy Robinson, walking to lunch with the Ellesmere twins. Or some AI thing. There's an app that does it. You got it, asks the twin, who today is Harriet. Nah, it's like invite only. It's a cover-up, says James Fulham, the chemistry teacher, over a cup of weak tea and a stale digestive biscuit. Look at it. All the attention's on this video. So what isn't our attention on, eh? It's not on the portal inside your weights cupboard, says Andrew Graham. That's what they're hiding. Yeah, you may laugh, James says, but something keeps making them vanish. I've had to order three new sets this month. She's in my sister's class, says Lewis Turner. Has to wear her hood the whole time, or the halo shows. You think she's really a prophet? Dave Northey asks. Like, someone who goes here? For real? I mean, if she was just a changeling or something, I'd be fine, but... Annie Malvery, the girl with one eye, shakes her head. She's not a changeling. Not one of the others. I don't know what she is, but she's not one of them. Jude Williams taps the ash out of her pipe on the wall of the smoking area and leans over as Simon Evans loads the video on YouTube between drags of the cigarette. It's really good, isn't it? She says. You can't even see the crates. Crates? Yeah, they put, like, crates under the water, so they came up to just below the surface. That's what she's standing on. Really clever. Most times I give out a special effects assignment, and I just get these terrible CGI things they try to add in some free mobile app. This one went full-on practical old school. Absolutely getting an A. Like hell, it's fake, says Emma Southwell. It's Abby Reacher. She's always been fucking weird. And she throws a screwed-up ball of paper at Abby's head. Abby unwraps it to find a picture of a cross and the words, You're getting nailed. Abby keeps her head down, tries to avoid everyone. Thinks about messaging Tobin and Lipstick, but doesn't doesn't get any messages from them. Of course they know it's her. She can deny it all she likes. They know. Let it pass, she thinks. Something else will come along soon. They'll forget all about it. It'll pass. And maybe, with better luck, with a news economy that didn't require journalists to chase clicks instead of stories, that would have been true. But that evening, the video plays on the local news. The transmitter mast broadcasting it to every home on every street. Her father had been watching the news when she came in and had immediately switched off the TV. Abby looked up the report later, watching the reporter nodding along as a talking head had said, The important thing is parents be informed. Wouldn't you want to know if your child was sharing a school with one of them? At lunch, she climbs up to Junkyard Roof. The lock to the roof access of the geography block has been broken for as long as she can remember. It's a mess of fag ends, aircon outflows, and the detritus of broken classroom equipment. It's where you go when you want to deal with as few people as possible. Jude Williams joins her a couple of minutes later, holding a pair of water bottles. 
Thought I'd find you here. Oh, uh, miss. Jude, please. You of all people get to call me Jude. Have this. You're under a lot of stress. You need to stay hydrated. Abby looks at the bottle, wondering if this is some kind of joke. How did you know I was up here? This is Junkyard Roof. It's where you go when you feel like trash. Jude leans over the boundary wall, peering slightly distastefully at the students and teachers wandering below. You're not trash, Abby. You know that, right? Doesn't seem to be the general opinion, Abby mutters. Jude sighs. No, doesn't feel that way. Oh, balls. A van has just driven up into the school car park. A woman with a microphone and two men with cameras get out. Let's just... She pulls Abby down so they're sat behind the wall, invisible from the ground. I thought it'd blow over, Abby says. It will, eventually. But not gonna lie, you've probably got a bit more of this to deal with yet. Quite a lot of the staff have had reporters going after them with questions. Some people have started saying it's a film project, so that's getting traction. If they find out it's not, are you going to be in trouble? Probably. Deal with that when we come to it. But the story holds up. Got my boyfriend to work out how you get an effect like that. He's a photographer, so he's used to messing around with people on film. Thank you. Jude swigs from her bottle. Bet you wish you hadn't gone for the shortcut now. I thought it was safe. Jude shakes her head. It's never safe. Sorry this is how you found out. People don't like you when you're different. Yeah, like you've ever had to deal with something like this. Miss, I know you're trying to help, but people thinking you're weird because you wear funny clothes and smoke weed isn't the same. You don't understand this. Jude rolls her eyes and flicks Abby's water bottle. It turns red and the smell of wine blossoms in Abby's nostrils. Bitch, I'm 33. No one understands this better than me. Abby's mouth has dropped open. It takes her a couple of tries to be able to speak. How long have you known? All my life, same as you. She flicks her own bottle and takes a swig of wine. There's nothing wrong with you, Abby. I know it doesn't feel that way at times, but there's not. And the people who matter aren't going to care. But a bit of advice from one prophet to another. Get yourself some gloves. When the stigmata starts, it's sudden, and hard to hide. Um, thanks? Abby puts her head over the wall. The reporter is still there, talking to someone who looks like Emma. You talk to your friends about this? Jude asks. The one whose mother slept with an equation, and the one who terrifies the Secret Service. They don't want to talk to me. They're normal. They do, trust me. They're your friends. They're not going to care. Abby drinks some wine. It's drier than she likes. Um, your boyfriend, does he know that you're... Oh yeah, he knows. How did you tell him? Jude snorts. I didn't. I was going to. I was trying to work out how. Then we were on a date and it went really well. And we ended up in bed for the first time, and then a choir of angels started singing hallelujah. Oh my god. What did he say? Jude looks smug. He said, I agree with their assessment. Tobin and Lipstick are sat by the school pond. Tobin refining her proof of Fermat's theorem... Lipstick, scrolling through her phone. Uh, hi, Tobin says when Abby sits down next to them. Yo, says Lipstick, without looking up from her phone. There is a period of awkward silence. Then Abby says, That video, that was me. It was real. Lipstick shrugs. Yeah, we know. Doesn't matter, mate. I mean, it clearly does, Abby says. It's like you've not wanted to talk to me since it came out. In fairness, Tobin does look uneasy. A flick of the eyes to Abby's forehead and hands, looking for a halo, looking for blood. But it's unconscious. 
and when she realises Abby has spotted it, she looks down. Guilty. Yeah. Lipstick shrugs again, talking as much with her shoulders as her words. Because that video was clearly you, and you kept telling us it wasn't like we were idiots. Sorry. I just... Nah. It's fine. I know you're going through stuff. It's a dumb thing to be annoyed about. But I was annoyed. It is what it is. You're still you. Just don't try to convert me or whatever. Yeah, and there's been, like, weirder people than you, Tobin chimes in. Remember that girl who said she was raised by wolves? Oh yeah, Lipstick laughs. Or that kid who only spoke machine code? Sorry, one sec. She stands up and points around the small courtyard. Behind the tree, two on the roof, one in the 2004 blue Citroen, three rows back in the car park, get lost. There is a distinct vanishing of SAS men and a screech of tyres. But yeah, those guys were weird. You're alright. And this doesn't entirely make Abby feel better. This state is of different but accepted her friends have dropped her into. But it's better than outcast. Better than unclean. And she'll cling on to that like it's an anchor. She may not feel normal, but she does feel something like relief. This lasts for approximately seven hours, at which point Emma Southwell is shown on the evening news saying, Of course it wasn't a film assignment, it's Abby Reacher. Everyone knows she's a freak. It happens fast, the next morning. Abby is doorstep by a crowd of cameras, microphones and questions fired like artillery shells. Can you confirm you engage in public miraculous activity? Did you put the Featherstone Bakery out of business? Did you threaten to raise the Southwell house with holy fire? Abby says nothing, looks at the ground and walks forward as the crowd parts in front of her like a sea. Was this a miracle? The reporters and camera operators will say so later, say their feet moved unwillingly, say they had no control. And this is wrong. They moved aside because Abby approached, because they were wary. Because you don't just stand there when someone's about to collide with you. But they will remember it as a miracle. And so, a miracle it will become. Tobin and Lipstick are waiting on either side of the crowd, and they take up defensive positions either side of her in unspoken agreement. Two members of the senior staff wait at the school gates. Jude Williams is hurrying toward them, but the senior staff mask is faster. Abigail Reacher, it says. Come with me. We're coming too, says Lipstick. The mask says... No. The head is sat behind his desk with fingers steepled. The senior staff are behind Abby, between her and the door. You know what you are accused of, the head says. I haven't done anything wrong. You performed miracles in public. I didn't, Abby tries. It was for a film assignment? It's not real? Yeah, we have heard that explanation. And trust, we will be having a conversation with Miss Williams about its origins. But this conversation is about you. This school cannot condone people of your type. There are children here. Now Abby can see how this goes. She is expelled. Her family will get doxxed by some unknown on an online forum. You will probably genuinely believe they are keeping the public safe. They will wake up one day to find a cross painted on the front door in red paint. Nails will be pushed through the letterbox. And one day she won't be careful enough. She'll be out on the common or on the street and there'll be a crowd holding stones. Maybe someone will make a little memorial for her. With a teddy bear. Probably not. After all, a tolerant society never said it would tolerate you forever. Unnatural little thing. And she knows, like a revelation, exactly what to say. This is insane. Her father is pacing the room, clutching the letter from the school in one hand. This is absolutely insane. Her mother sits on the sofa, hands clasped. Maybe it'll be good for her, she says. 
She's clearly uncertain. Her hands are being wrung tight as a whippet. She can't quite meet Abby's gaze. She can show everyone that she's just like them. But she's not just like them. What's going to happen when she walks out on that lake in front of everyone? They'll be putting up a cross inside 20 minutes. No, her mother says, voice all a quiver. No, they wouldn't. We've known some of these people for years. Fine, her father snaps. 30 minutes. It's okay, Abby says. It was my idea. I can do it. Her father looks at her, despairing. Even her mother is pale. Abby! Buttercup, you don't have to do this. I'm going to, Abby says. It's fine. That evening, she runs herself a bath, lays on the water, reaches for one of her father's dumbbells. They do not conduct the trial at the canal. That was the first thought. Recreate the conditions completely. But they cannot guarantee the space will be free of narrowboats. So instead, they are at the shore of the lake in Bowes Common. Abby stands on the end of one of the short piers used by fishermen. She is dressed in her coat, trainers, full school uniform. She does not have a swimming costume. Hasn't done since the little one with the dolphins. And that no longer fits. There is a crowd. This wasn't the head's plan. He wanted this trial conducted in private, but there is no stopping the rumour mill. Abby was instructed not to tell anyone, which she mostly complied with. But of course she was going to explain things to Tobin and Lipstick. And of course the school had to inform her parents, and from there, well... Might as well try to get ink out of water. Every teacher and student with a free period is here. Some who don't are here too. Tobin and Lipstick should be in history, but instead they're here to provide what small support they can. Jude stands with a long-haired man holding a camera, gripping his arm like a python. Emma Southwell is taking a selfie. Abby's parents are there, along with strangers, voyeurs and influencers. Everyone likes a ducking. The phones were already filming. So are the reporters. The head does not like this either, but Abby was doorstepped again and they just followed her here. Abby stands, staring at the water. One of the senior staff moves to push her forward, but the head holds up a steadying hand. Whenever you're ready, Miss Reacher. Abby shuffles forward, stumbling, uneasy. The lake waits, silent, still. She does not remove her shoes, her jacket, just walks unsteadily onward. The crowd holds its breath as she places a foot on the water, and it drops like a diving bell to the lake floor. She keeps walking, the water reaching her ankles, her knees. The mud sucks every step. Emma yells, it's a trick! At the same time as her father calls, she can come out now. She walks on. The water has reached her waist and slowly creeps higher. Someone, she thinks Jude, yells her name. She turns awkwardly around. Three dozen smartphones are pointed her way. TV cameras stare her down like Martian war machines. Her parents... Tobin and Lipstick are all beckoning her back. But Abby's not going to let this chance slip away from her. She's been waiting for it her whole life. She raises her arms and lets herself fall backward, letting the water close over her, brown, murky, comforting, a gentle pressure that might be love. The crowd waits for her to surface. It waits. And it waits. She's going to come up soon, isn't she? Abby's mother says. She's going to come up soon? May. Tobin mutters to Lipstick. How long can someone last down there? The head has apparently realised how many people will see him doing this to a young girl 
who is emphatically not walking on water and has one of the senior staff by the shirt saying, Get her out. Get her out. Get her out. Now. Abby's father isn't saying anything. He has thrown off his jacket and is running to the lake shore. Jude is throwing up at the back of the crowd. And Abby... Abby lies on the lake bed, mud in her hair, water in her lungs, feeling her body trying to rise but being held down by all the weights she's stolen from James Fulham's cupboard, stuffed into her shoes and pockets along with a pair of her father's dumbbells and as many rocks as she could fit. And this, she thinks, this is what it's like to be normal. She lies, and she is drowning, and she has never felt so alive. Modem Prometheus is written by Neil Merton, the voice of the city is Kate Angier, and with music and production by me, Tris Oten. For bonus episodes and behind-the-scenes content, join our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash modemprometheus. If you're not ready for that kind of commitment, please rate and review us on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you're listening to this right now. Our next story is due on the Hunter's Moon, the 28th of October, when the Wild Hunt ride. Remember, there is nothing wrong with you. And that weird kid you bully, there's nothing wrong with them, either. <laughs>